Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome uh, to the National Eye Institute's Facebook Live about Stargardt disease. My name is Claudia Costabile, and I will be the moderator of this Facebook Live with our expert guest, Dr. Brian Brooks. Um, I would like to start by introducing Dr. Brooks, and then uh, we will go through a few common questions about Stargardt, and we will also talk about a new clinical trial to investigate the, a potential therapy for Stargardt disease. At the end of this first general questions, we will take your questions. So Dr. Brooks is a senior investigator and a clinical uh, director at the National Eye Institute, or NEI. He is a graduate of the University of Maryland, and he holds both an MD and a PhD from University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Brooks completed his residency training in ophthalmology and a fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology at University of Michigan. But he didn't stop there. He also completed a fellowship in medical genetics, and he's board certified uh, by the American College of Medical Genetics and the American Board of Ophthalmology. The goal of Dr. Brooks' research is to understand the causes and mechanisms of inherited eye diseases, especially those that affect children, and to use that knowledge to develop prevention strategies and treatments. Every day at NEI, Dr. Brooks oversees clinical research, including scientific review and safety of clinical trials. He advises the NEI director on issues about clinical research and the NEI clinical program, and he serves as the, uh, in the medical executive committee of the clinical center at the National Institutes of Health. Welcome, Dr. Brooks. Thank you, Claudia. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, uh, we are going to start with some general questions about Stargardt. And the first question I have for you is, what is a Stargardt disease and how it affects our eyes? Yeah, so Stargardt disease is a genetic condition that causes vision loss due to a problem with the retina and the cells that support the retina, which are called the retinal pigment epithelium or RPE for short. Um, the retina, of course, is the tissue in the back of our eyes that senses light and converts it into an electrical signal that is then sent back to the brain to help us see. Uh, Stargardt disease is caused when there are two genetic misspellings in the ABCA4 gene. Uh, and another name for Stargardt disease is ABCA4 retinopathy. Uh, now, all of us have a few misspellings or mutations in our DNA, and these are scattered throughout our 20,000 or so uh, genes that, it, that each of us have. Now, for most of our genes, we get one copy from our mom and one copy from our dad. So if there is a misspelling by chance in one copy of a gene, it's generally unlikely that we would have a mutation on the other copy of that same gene. However, sometimes both mom and dad, uh, they carry a mutation, uh, both carry a mutation in a gene, here the ABCA4 gene, and by chance those misspellings are both transmitted to a child. Uh, this is called autosomal recessive inheritance, and when a family has one child who's affected by Stargardt disease, there's a 25% chance with each pregnancy that a subsequent child uh, will be affected. We think that the reason the retina degenerates in Stargardt disease is because of an abnormally fast accumulation of what is a normal byproduct of our metabolism called lipofusin. Now, all of us make uh, some level of lipofusin and this tends to build up in the supporting layers of the retina, the retinal pigment epithelium or RPE with age. People with Stargardt disease uh, build this byproduct up at a faster rate than normal. And unfortunately, when RPE cells accumulate too much lipofusin, they become sick and they die. And then this subsequently causes the retina cells that they're supporting uh, to die and therefore leading uh, to vision loss. Um, how is Stargardt disease diagnosed, Dr. Brooks? So Stargardt disease is usually uh, picked up by an eye doctor because a person is complaining of a decrease in their central vision or visual acuity. 
we can't get that person to 2020 visual acuity with glasses or contact lenses. Uh, sometimes kids might be picked up with a vision screening test either at school or with their pediatrician. The suspicion of Stargardt disease is raised on eye exam where the doctor can see areas of the central retina that look abnormal and degenerating. We sometimes see little bits or flecks of that byproduct lipofusin that are scattered throughout the retina as well. If we do a field of vision test, we can see uh, areas usually in the center where the retina is not picking up the light as well as it should. Now, special kinds of pictures can help us with the diagnosis. Um, an example of this is a scan called optical coherence tomography, or OCT for short. Uh, this is a technique that lets us non-invasively look at the layers of the retina. In Stargardt disease, the layers that have the light sensing cells look thin and abnormal. Uh, at the NIH, which is a research hospital, another test we frequently do is electroretinography, or ERG. The ERG measures the electrical activity of the entire retina in responses to flashes of light uh, when the patient is either sitting in dim light or in regular bright light. Uh, we can also, um, so those are measures of rod function, which is in dim light or in light like we normally operate in uh, of so-called cone vision, rods and cones being the two type of light sensing cells or photoreceptors that we have. Cones can also uh, help us with uh, color vision. Uh, and it turns out they're especially clustered in our very center of, of vision. Now, in some people, this test looks pretty normal, which is a sign that progression is likely to be slower than uh, in those people where the test looks abnormal at the time of diagnosis. Uh, ultimately, in 2021, in order to make the diagnosis firm, we have to send the patient's uh, blood for genetic testing. We can confirm that there are two misspellings in the ABCA4 gene, thus nailing down the diagnosis. Uh, this is important because there are things that look a lot like classic Stargardt disease, but are caused by mutations in other genes. Uh, the genetic test can help us distinguish between these. And because some of the therapies that people are researching for retinal degenerations in general uh, can be gene specific. So knowing whether you have a mutation in ABCA4 versus one of the other genes can be important. All right, and uh, how common is Stargardt disease? So Stargardt disease is a pretty rare condition, somewhere in the vicinity of about one in 10,000 people. Uh, of the inherited retinal problems we see at the NIH, however, it's one of the more common conditions. Stargardt disease can present in childhood, but it also may not be evident until the 40s or even uh, the 50s in, in people. Are there any uh, treatments to uh, Stargardt disease at this time? So unfortunately, no, there's, there's nothing approved by the Food and Drug Administration or FDA. Uh, however, the good news is, is that we and others are actively studying uh, treatments in clinical trials. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing here in a minute. But first, let me uh, break down a couple things that, that others are also trying. So one method, uh, to potentially treat this or other conditions is to give a medication, a pill that slows the rate of progress of the disease. Uh, some cell, uh, some drugs rather, can make the retina cells more resistant to that, uh, to damage by that byproduct called lipofusin. Some drugs may help the cells uh, to rid themselves of that lipofusin. And then uh, lastly, some drugs may decrease the rate at which the lipofusin accumulates. In each of these cases, expectation, the expectation would be that we would be able to preserve vision for longer. Uh, we're probably unlikely in most cases to actually restore vision. Now, another uh, method folks have uh, probably heard about uh, is to give back a normal copy of, in this case, the ABCA4 gene to the retina. Uh, this is commonly referred to as gene replacement therapy. 
Uh, in a nutshell, uh, a normal copy of the gene of interest is packaged in a virus and delivered to the retina via usually a, a surgery, but sometimes an injection directly into the eye. The gene gets into cells and then hopefully restores them to something closer to, to normal. Some of the participants uh, today may be aware of the remarkable progress that's been made in other forms of retinal degeneration, uh, particularly in one form of childhood retinal degeneration called labor congenital amaurosis or LCA caused by mutations in the RPE65 gene. Um, so in, in that series of studies, people appeared to actually gain some visual function, which was extremely exciting. The trials for ABC4 retinopathy uh, have been more challenging for a couple of reasons. So the ABC4 gene is pretty big, and the viruses that were used for the RPE65 gene trials uh, simply won't work for something that, that big. Um, we're also, in this case, trying to get the gene into the light sensing cells, the photoreceptors, and rather than the supporting cells, the retinal pigment epithelium. And it turns out that that's uh, a little harder to do. So while we've not seen any major breakthroughs in gene replacement therapy for ABCA4 retinopathy, there's a lot of really smart people uh, working on this, and I'm very confident that uh, that will uh, eventually become a reality. And then lastly, the, the, the pie in the sky would be to actually replace cells that have degenerated in the retina as a result of ABC4 retinopathy. Here we may be talking about the light sensing cells, the photoreceptors themselves, uh, and or that supporting layer of cells called the retinal pigment epithelium. You may conceive of doing this by either coaxing embryonic stem cells from a human embryo or reprogram cells uh, from an individual. Those can be skin cells, blood cells, a number of different cell types that can actually be reprogrammed to be like embryonic stem cells. And then using specific protocols in the lab, these cells can be made to be very similar to the retinal pigment epithelium or to the light sensing cells, the photoreceptors. And ideally we would be able to re replace those surgically into a retina and therefore restore vision. Uh, to be honest though, that is probably the the hardest of the three strategies to do for a number of reasons, uh, perhaps the most notable of which is that we not only have to get the cells to be the type of cells that we want and to get them to survive in the eye, but we also have to get them to connect back to the rest of the retina and the brain in the correct way in order for us to regain suitable vision. Uh, again, although I think that is a challenge, I'm cautiously optimistic that with all the smart people working along that area, that uh, we'll, we'll see some progress. That's great. Uh, can you tell uh, our audience today what NEI is doing uh, to study uh, StarGuard and specifically about your clinical trial that's currently uh, recruiting patients? Yeah. So I'm happy to. So our trial is looking at whether a commonly prescribed oral anti-diabetic drug called metformin can slow the rate of progression in ABCA4 retinopathy. Metformin uh, is one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the United States. So there's a lot of experience that doctors have with its use and with its side effects. Uh, so why would we even want to try this uh, anti-diabetic drug for a retinal degeneration? Well, it turns out that metformin, in addition to helping with diabetes, also appears to help the general health and metabolism of cells, including, we think, uh, retinal cells. My uh, colleague, Dr. Koppel Barty, has studied this drug in the lab and has some exciting unpublished data that uh, help uh, to support this, this model uh, using uh, both animals and cell culture uh, in his laboratory. We also think that metformin uh, may help cells to better cope with that toxic byproduct called lipofusin and therefore uh, to stay alive longer. Um, interestingly, there are other groups that are looking at metformin as a possible treatment for other kinds of neurodegenerative diseases. And there's even a trial of metformin for a related but different and more common cause of blindness 
called age-related macular degeneration or AMD that I believe is being run out of the University of California, San Francisco. Um, the, the doses that we're using in, of metformin in this study are the same range of doses that we would use in patients who are diabetic. So patients start on 500 milligrams a day, and then they ramp up slowly to a maximum tolerated dose of 2,000, uh, up to 2,000 milligrams uh, per day. Uh, patients are monitored with routine blood work and uh, by an internist or a pediatrician, depending on their age at, at all of their visits. In, in general, metformin is pretty well tolerated. The most common side effect is GI upset, uh, things like nausea, vomiting, cramping, diarrhea, and the like. Um, these sim uh, symptoms tend to become less with time and they can also often be reduced if we switch folks that are 18 years of age or older to an extended release rather than an immediate release form of the drug. Uh, now, these are also just the same type of tablets that you would get if you were diabetic and you were going to get that prescription filled at your local pharmacy, your local CVS or Walgreens or the like. Okay, who is eligible to join the clinical trial? So in, in order to qualify for the trial, participants must have a molecular genetic diagnosis of ABCA4 retinopathy. Uh, so they have to have had a genetic test that either we or uh, we do or that others have done in the past. And the patients need to be 12 years of age or older. Uh, the reason for the age cutoff is that some of the testing we do as part of the trial requires a fair amount of cooperation and kids younger than this sometimes have uh, some, some trouble with that. So for this and for other clinical trials, we have to know also what to follow in particular to determine whether or not our, our treatment is working. Um, that test that we follow is called a clinical outcome variable. So in this trial, um, we will be following that optical coherence tomography or OCT scan and uh, to qualify, participants will have to have some specific characteristics to that scan. Um, unlike many trials, uh, th this trial of metformin is an open labels trial, uh, meaning that everybody gets the drug. So normally, if we're talking about a treatment for a common condition, let's say high blood pressure, we would gather a lot of uh, patients uh, with that condition and then randomly assign them to receive the medication in question or a sugar pill, which is called the placebo and which shouldn't have any effect on uh, hypertension in this, in this example. So the, the participants and the doctors would not know that the participant was, what the participant was given until uh, an external group uh, breaks the code and looks at the data, usually at the, the end of the study. And this kind of arrangement helps to reduce the likelihood of, of bias, either on behalf of the patient or of the, the doctors. Um, now that is is great. It works really well for common diseases like uh, like high blood pressure, but it's, it's kind of hard to do that uh, for rarer diseases like Stargardt disease, because to do those kind of trials, you generally need a large number of patients. Um, so at the NEI, we've taken a slightly different approach. So um, for a number of years, we've been following a group of patients with Stargardt disease as part of a natural history study. Uh, the patients, they, they've come back at regular intervals and we get the same tests, set of tests every single time that, uh, that they come and so therefore carefully and systematically uh, following them. So it turns out that when we look at that OCT scan of some participants, we can see a slow but steady uh, progression over time. And although this uh, rate of progression is slow, uh, the test is very sensitive. And although the rate of progression is pretty consistent uh, between the eyes of a given patient, it can also vary significantly between uh, patient to patient, between individuals. So the study requires uh, that a participant be followed at regular intervals for at least uh, two years with at least four of these scans of sufficient quality so that we can uh, establish a rate for that individual patient. Um, we then put the patient on metformin, there's no sugar pill, no placebo, and we follow them at six month intervals for two years. And we ask the question, did we change the rate of progression uh, in this particular patient. In, in this case, 
the patient is serving as his or her own control. Uh, this kind of arrangement helps us to perform the trial with a lower number of total participants, which is helpful in a rare disease like Stargardt disease. Um, now, participants uh, who were on the metformin trial or who may, may be on the metformin trial don't need to necessarily have been followed at the NIH as part of the natural history study to, to be part. Um, they simply need to have the required number of OCT scans and they need to be of sufficient quality and nature. Um, and we need to have those for at least uh, two years time, as I mentioned. Uh, many times patients who have been followed by experts in inherited retinal diseases will, will already have those, those scans in their medical records. Uh, if a patient doesn't quite have uh, all, of the, uh, all of the data that they need, we're also happy to follow patients to establish that rate of change before formally enrolling them in the trial and putting them on metformin. Okay, uh, how can people find out uh, information about this clinical trial and uh, can their doctors refer them to the clinical trial as well? Uh, yes, so, um, so uh, participants can uh, find information on the National Eye Institute's uh, website, which is www.nei for National Eye Institute, .nih, NI, which is uh, National Institutes of Health, .gov, so www.nei.nih.gov. Um, they can also uh, find the study and some particulars about it on another website called clinicaltrials.gov. Clinical trials is all one word. Uh, and then lastly, the study coordinator, uh, Allison Bomji, uh, can be reached via her email, which is Bomji, A, which is B-A-M-J-I-A, at nei.nih.gov. So Bomji, A, at nei.nih.gov. Okay. Um, I have one, one other question related to the clinical trial. Um, where is the clinical trial taking place? Yeah, so so currently the the trial is uh, just happening at the NIH. Uh, we're, it's slated to run for about five years. Um, we uh, hope to have recruitment done in the next uh, year and a half, and then follow patients one metformin for two years time. Uh, at which point everybody goes off drug, and we follow them uh, for for safety reasons for at least another year. Um, but we're we're really excited that we're pretty far along with discussions uh, with the, the doctors at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Jawara Sundara, uh, who sees a lot of patients with uh, Stargardt disease there. And so we're cautiously optimistic that that will work out and that there will be uh, a second site. Um, we, we hope that that will help with recruitment, uh, making it easier for uh, patients, particularly those in the Midwest, uh, to, to be part of the trial. Um, I sh should, should note that the, the trial is free of charge, so there's, there's no uh, cost to participating in the trial. The testing that's done, the eye exams that are done, the medication that's given are all uh, given free of charge, uh, provided the, the, the patient qualifies and is able to give us uh, informed consent. Uh, we also have funding to uh, at least defray uh, some of the cost of uh, travel and of uh, lodging during the time that uh, patients are, are coming to see us. Okay. Um, so how long do the patients stay in the trial and how long is the trial running for? Yeah, so the, the patients will all be treated for a total of two years at six month intervals. The, the total length of the trial is about five years. And the reason for that is that not everybody enrolls at once. So we're going to try to enroll for about a year and a half, hopefully get to our uh, required number, which is in the vicinity of 40 to 44 patients. Uh, and then those patients will be followed on drug. And then once the two years is up, they will be uh, taken off drug and we will follow them to make sure that there is no toxicity. Um, I should also note that the, the trial is being monitored by an external board. It's called a Data Safety Monitoring Committee, or DSMC. So it's not me or the folks at University of Michigan that decide whether or not this is working and safe. They're external people who are making sure that things look good and that are they're being run as they should be. Um, and in the event that 
the the drug looks really good um they can also do things like say well no you should keep people on the drug um, in which case we would amend that but that's not something that we necessarily uh, bank on okay uh, thank you very much for all the information so at this moment i would like to open uh, for audience uh, if they have any questions to send us uh, i'll give you guys a minute and while we wait for your questions i will ask a question of my own uh, what if a patient cannot stay for the whole two years uh, during the trial, Dr. Brooks? Yeah, so, so participants are, are free to withdraw from the trial at any point in time. If a participant withdraws right away, uh, we're, we're happy to follow them uh, just as we would follow any other patient with ABCA4 retinopathy. If someone uh, drops out further into the study, we continue to follow them actually under that study, although their data will be analyzed separately from the rest of the, the folks that stay on the drug for the entire time. All right. Um, okay. Uh, it looks like we have one question, and uh, the question is, my 22-year-old diagnosed with Stargardt's at age 10, uh, my 25-year-old shows no symptoms. Is it likely that she will ever develop symptoms in the future, given that her brothers, uh, given her brothers early onset, and uh, her blood was submitted to the NEI, uh, you know, but the result was not returned for her yet. Uh, so, can her brother also be uh, evaluated or get uh, you know, evaluated at NEI? Yeah. So, uh, so the the best way to ensure that a sibling is or is not affected is by a detailed eye exam similar to the one that we're uh, doing at the at the NEI. The, uh, if there's any doubt about whether an individual is affected, then, then, then genetic testing can absolutely be, be sent to try to help clarify that, that situation. Just speaking in general, I don't know this particular patient or the family or uh, any of, I guess, the details beyond what was written in the chat. Um, but in general, um, people within a family tend to be more similar than, uh, than people not. So the fact that the second child has gotten into his or her 20s, uh, I would say is at least a very good sign. All right. Um, what if a, a patient in the clinical trial doesn't respond to metformin? Are there, uh, does NEI refer them to other trials? Are there any other trials going on? Oh, yes, absolutely. And so um, I didn't go into a lot of detail about the other uh, drug trials that are going on, but there are absolutely other drug trials. We uh, let patients know not only about our trial, but about uh, all the other trials that are going on. Uh, going on, trying to give them some background information uh, about those uh, same trials. I, I should also mention, Claudia, that because uh, because metformin is uh, so rapidly cleared from the system, people that participate in the metformin trial, if if metformin turns out that it, that it doesn't work, it really shouldn't disqualify them for then participating in other clinical trials down the line. We would not anticipate because the drug is so rapidly cleared from the body that it would have any effect on someone's ability to participate in, in future clinical trials. All right. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, I am 51 uh, and have Stargardt disease. I am highly functioning and I don't have to take uh, high risks. Um, is this trial to stop deterioration or to seek improvement in vision? Um, so uh, it would be great if we saw improvement, but I, based upon what I know as a scientist, I would say that it really is probably more to help preserve vision uh, over a period of time by making the cells in the retina be healthier for, for longer. So, uh, and that's generally the case for most of the oral medications, I would say, that are being, that are being tested. Hey, can uh, someone from another country uh, be a, a part of this trial? So theoretically, yes. When you're part of, when, when you're from another country, uh, it, it it does create, admittedly, certain hurdles. We we can't support travel from other countries uh, to to come to the United States. That's just part of uh, NIH policy, by and large. 
uh, if patients are able to come and they otherwise are able to understand the consent and they otherwise qualify by all the other means that uh, other patients would qualify, we would certainly consider their, their application. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, our 10 year old daughter was diagnosed two months ago. Uh, she will be 12 uh, uh, before the recruitment of the study is over. We have the genetic testing next month. Is there a good central place to find information once we have her results? Uh, yeah, so um, going to our Office of Communication uh, has set up uh, a nice information page uh, on the NEI website, so that's nei.nih.gov. Uh, there's also information on clinicaltrials.gov, where if you do a search under ABCA4, uh, you'll find both this trial or this, this trial and others that are being done related to uh, ABCA4 retinopathy. Uh, also, just reaching out to Alice and Bomji at bomga.nei.nih.gov. That is uh, is also an option, and she can provide written copies of the consent form information about the the, the trial, et, et cetera. Okay, um, and you know, just a reminder: we're going to keep posting that page on the 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 comment section here. So, if people are interested in uh, more information and going to a centralized page where we have uh, this clinical trial information in, um, it, it's we're going to post them a couple of times during the. Uh, this chat and after. Um, one more question I have for you. Uh, if metforming works for me, can I continue to be seen at NEI? And is there an eye doctor there that can uh, take me as his or her uh, regular patient? Yeah, so we, we do follow patients with ABCA4 retinopathy. Um, whether we continue to follow uh, patients uh, off the trial uh, will depend probably upon a number of factors, but we generally uh, are, are open to doing that. One thing that we can't do because we're a, a research hospital and not a regular hospital is follow people for uh, their regular eye exams, not a research-based eye exam, uh, where we might be looking, say, at their, their glaucoma or their cataracts or those, those kinds of things and, and treating their glaucoma or their cataracts. It's really important that patients have a regular eye doctor close to where they live, um, not only because that's the nature of how the NIH clinical program works, uh, but also because we don't have an emergency room. We don't have uh, a, a place where you know, somebody uh, gets, a, gets a red eye or they get hit in the eye and they need to be seen sooner rather than later. Uh, that's something that should probably be handled by a, a local ophthalmologist. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, could you expand on the mechanism of action of metforming? Yeah, so um, without getting too much in the in the weeds, so we, we think that metformin helps with cellular health and metabolism by basically improving the, the energy output. So our cells make something called ATP which uh, is what fuels the, the metabolism of our, of our cells. And that's done via a, a portion of the cells called the mitochondria. So we think that metformin helps in that way by stimulating that process. Metformin may also help with the clearing of that toxic byproduct. So helping in the, the cells to deal with that, to, to get rid of the, the lipofusin a little better uh, over time. Um, basically uh, d disposing of the of the waste material. And so those are at least two of the, the proposed mechanisms of metformin, although it, it is also known to have lots of effects within the cell it, itself. And so it's, it's possible that there's still something that we don't understand um, that uh, we're still exploring in the model systems. Okay. Um, is there any risk of participating in the trial and what, what those risks would be? Yeah, so there, there's whenever you're doing an intervention, whether that's giving somebody a pill or doing a surgery, uh, there's, there's always risks that are associated. Uh, I, I mentioned that the most common side effect that comes along with, with taking metformin is GI upset. Uh, as I said, most patients uh, tolerate that. It tends to 
decrease with time. It tends to be reduced by going on the extended release formulation. Um, there are also some rarer complications of uh, metformin. Uh, these are particularly of concern if somebody has pre-existing liver or kidney disease. And so we, uh, we also have inclusion exclusion criteria for participating in the trial uh, based upon whether somebody has either liver or kidney disease. And if, if somebody does have those kinds of systemic diseases, they may not be able to participate. Um, there's also a very rare side effect that can be exacerbated, a metabolic side effect that can be exacerbated by giving certain kinds of uh, IV dye that are given during radiology procedures. And so if patients need those studies uh, while they were on the trial, we ask that they go off medication for a few days, have their study, and then after a few days go back on because this is a uh, slowly progressive disease and because this is a trial that's going on for two years, those few days of being off drug uh, probably would not uh, affect anything. Uh, like any medication that we take, uh, there are rare patients that can have allergies to the medication uh, when they go on it that can result in things like skin rashes or um, uh, other kinds of allergic symptoms. Okay, uh, one more question. When can people start sending in an application for their study? Is it open now? Yes, the study is, is open now. It's recently started. And so they can absolutely reach out now to, uh, to our folks, to our study coordinator. And uh, what we will request is we will uh, re request you to sign a copy of a medical release form uh, so that we can get records from your home physicians to see what's there and what's not there. And then it'll be an individual, on an individual basis, depending upon what someone has or doesn't have as to uh, whether we think that they might qualify and it would be worth them making the trip out to the NIH. Uh, there are some patients with Stargardt disease um, who, who won't qualify because of the, the, the state of their disease. So just speaking in general, patients with more advanced disease, it's hard to follow them using that, that measure called the OCT. And uh, patients who have broader a, a broader form of retinal degeneration, um, they also may not qualify just because the, the nature of the OCT scan doesn't really readily allow itself to, to qualify. So before somebody makes a trip either to us or hopefully Ann Arbor when they come on in line, uh, when they come online, that um, that we would want to evaluate and to at least have a high probability that they would be able to be followed and to be able to enroll in the study. Okay. Um, beyond the, the, the cost of the trial being, you know, no cost to patients and uh, NEI possibly covering some of the cost of travel, are patients uh, in any other way paid for this trial? No, pa patients are not paid um, uh, basically uh, a stipend for, uh, for the, the purpose of, of participating. Uh, in general, we, we, we do that because we don't want there to be, um, we want patients to participate because they are interested in participating in research. Uh, we hope that the, the drug, of course, works for the individual, but we don't want to have any kind of undue influence. It should really be the, the patient's decision because they understand the risks and potential benefits of being on metformin. Uh, they otherwise qualify and are willing to, to be followed along. And it's, and it's not just a, a payment, for instance, that would be an inducement. Okay. Um, Dr. Brooks, I think uh, we don't have any other questions, but I'll give uh, our audience um, some, a couple more minutes. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to share uh, with our audience uh, in terms of uh, Stargard disease or the trial? Well, I would just, uh, for all the participants that are online, uh, I would just, just like to offer them some hope that whether it's metformin or one of the other treatments that are being that are being evaluated elsewhere, that I, I really am optimistic that in the next five to ten years that we're going to be able to find something that looks like it's working, and uh, it may require, depending upon the the particulars of what it is we're talking about, it may require some further nailing down with further studies, 
but that I would want to give folks on the line uh, so, some hope that th there's a lot of smart people all around the world that are working on this condition and trying to find uh, treatments for it. So um, d do have hope. All right. Um, okay, so um, with that, uh, we're going to conclude uh, this Facebook Live. You can always message us, uh, you know, at the NEI Facebook page. Uh, you can email the trial coordinator. You can follow up with our uh, uh, web page. And uh, if you have any questions, you can also write them uh, at the comments. We're going we're gonna to be monitoring them for a little more. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you, Dr. Brooks, very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Claudia. It's been my pleasure.